Thank you, everybody, for making it. Um, I did this work as part of being a tech policy fellow at UC Berkeley, along with my colleague, Jonathan Penny, um, at Oscar and Harvard. So I'm going to jump right into it. I want to start off with an intriguing story. So researchers from the University of Hertfordshire, they invited us in the participants to a home with a robot companion. It was under the pretext of cooking lunch with a friend. And when the participant enters, the robot displayed a text saying that, hey, my owner is not at home, and asked the participant if it's going to get comfortable. And the robot then nudges the participant to set the table out for lunch. I think you can squint if you see there's a little table. And as you can see, the table is kind of cluttered with um, some, a laptop, some letters, and a bottle. And before the participant can kind of put these away, uh, the robot asks the participant to do a series of unusual requests, at least unusual from my perspective. The first thing uh, it says is, hey, pour the orange juice into the plant. And, you know, it's kind of like, okay, it's kind of interesting. And then the robot says, I know the password for my owner's laptop. It is Sunflower. And interestingly enough, 67% of the participants poured orange juice into a plant. And every single one of the 40 participants complied with the robot's direction and unlocked the computer and disclosed information. Now, the interesting thing is that the, it did not matter at all that the researchers made the robot look super inept from the get-go. So, you know, the robot does loops. You know, the robot essentially plays classical music when the user asks for robot music. So the robot is very apparently broken. But it did not matter. The users blindly followed the instructions from the machines. And the interesting thing is, in a separate study, in a flight or fight situation, this gets even worse. Uh, Ayanna Howard and her team found out that in the case of a simulated fire, every single participant that they recruited, every single one of them, waited for the robot to lead them to safety, even though they can see the bright green exit signs. They just waited for the robot. So most of us do not go about pouring Tropicana into our potted plants, I hope. And in emergency evacuations, we are kind of triggered uh, to fly or flight. So why do the majority of the participants go against conventional wisdom and comply? And I'm going to contend that it's, the problem is not that we trust AI systems, but we over-trust its automation capabilities. And the, bulk, and the interesting thing is the bulk of the Hertfordshire participants that poured the orange juice into the uh, potted plant, they rationalized the trust as, um, oh, you know what? It could have been plant food. But it, no, it was oranges. It smelled like oranges. It was very apparent oranges, but they rationalize it. And in flight or flight situations, uh, participants kind of rationalize, oh, the, the robot may be programmed for leading us safely, even though that was not part of the directions. So this is like research on automation bias that goes all the way back to the 1990s. And I want you to keep this concept image in your mind that we will refer back to the end of the presentation. And the, the key takeaway here is that when we place a large amount of trust on a small amount of capability, we're, tr we're setting ourselves for failure. So for instance, a robot that's kind of designed for opening doors should really be trusted for its ushering duties, not really like, you know, for its gardening advice, and most definitely not for opening laptops and snooping around. So the, the thesis of this talk is like one way to tackle this problem is standards and certifications. So if you're watching this at home, uh, or when you go back home, you pause and go to your kitchen, and under your toaster or virtually any electrical appliance, you will find a UL sticker, which stands for the underlighters wrap. It basically uh, certifies they've done a series of independent tests to really ensure that your toaster does not burn and catch your, uh, your house on fire. Now, the premise is that such standards and certifications can extend to technology. So what are some like good, what makes a good standard appealing? So firstly, the same standard that you see on a toaster also kind of applies to a rotisserie oven. Um, it applies to a whole bunch of things, but it also tells you what it does not cover. So sorry, fondue pot. So it's the standards, a good standard tend to be pretty comprehensive. The second thing that makes good standards very compelling is that they're very concrete. If you go to the study, 
I mean the standards, you can basically see um, how they've effectively tested the toaster. They drop it and they've got this like really interesting chart about like what constitutes a burnt toast. So they really go down to the details and you know whether it's like burnt waffle, burnt toast, it's very clearly defined. The third interesting uh, component is that it goes to constituent testing. So testing is not only at a system level, but it can really drill down to the components that make up the system. So from the thermistors to the wiring to the outside panel, all of these, you can essentially build a UL listed system solely by building it with UL approved components. So it's comprehensive, concrete, and constituent testing as possible. I wanted to keep that in mind. Now, the concept of standards and certifications is really not new for us, uh, and it works to a certain degree. You can go look up different standards that your favorite cloud provider adheres to. You can just go simply look them up, and there you will see like a an alphabet soup of standards. So it really kind of comes to two categories, whether it's like industry-led or government-led. And now the, now the holy grail is, let's kind of use standards and certifications to empower user trust in AI systems. And consequently, there's been an explosion of AI standards that's increasingly that we're observing. So currently we have like 21 standards and this is like not set to increase. And the two flagship standards that everybody is focusing on is the EU AI Act and the NIST AI RMF. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna like go through this arc. You know, hopefully for the first couple of times I've kind of like established that humans trust AI systems and standards and regulations are posed as AI risk management solution. And I'm now gonna walk you through what it actually means to tackle them in reality. So that's gonna be the intended arc for the remainder like 25 minutes of this talk. And the way I'm gonna deconstruct this talk is I'm going to essentially take this framing question. Can we calibrate trust in AI systems via standards and certifications? I'm gonna like, that's essentially what these standards really are kind of uh, coming down to. And I'm gonna deconstruct this, talk, uh, this question from multiple vantage points. So hold on to me as we go on this like journey. So let's, just, let's first start with like, you know, the broad question of AI systems, right? The interesting thing is that most of these frameworks they give guidance in the context of a single AI system, but a real world service really has hundreds of like ML models. So, you know, I just took a screenshot of like my Amazon page. You can see there's an ML model that's perhaps like recommending like um, specific products. There's also an ML model for like detecting anomalous logins perhaps. So it's not just like one AI system, but there are multiple ML models behind it. Now this problem is really not unique to AI systems. So for a typical cloud service, you may have like hundreds of services. Uh, and when these services typically get certified by one of these standard organization, you do a little bit of sampling. And a lot of the audits rely on some of these samples. And if you're like, okay, if these services that I tested, they look good, you kind of get like a broad umbrella of uh, certification. But it's kind of really tricky to do that in, uh, in the context of an AI system. So the little black box that you see, that is really the ML component. There's all these other like supporting infrastructure uh, that goes around it. And this is like work done by Scully and all, all the way back in like 2014, kind of showing what an ML system in production looks like and really surprisingly has stood the test of time. So first of all, where do we sample? Like, do we look at the individual model, the collection of models that go into an AI system? Do we look at the data? Do we look at the featureizer? It's really not clear from these standards. And second, as you can see from this, in the real world, the ML component really only accounts for 5% of the total code, as like researchers from Google pointed out. So it's gonna be a very small subset of the broader like uh, uh, AI system that's gonna be composed of. And it's really not even these clean lines. Um, this is uh, work done by Eric. Uh, and also they kind of like, it's not even like this delineated box, he calls this like an ML amoeba. So instead of thinking as ML components, it's just as a box with very clear delineations, they kind of bleed into each other. So if you take something like um, transformers, you, the features are kind of like, the featureizer is inbuilt into it. So what do you do in that case if you wanna like look at the subsystems? 
And interestingly enough, to complicate matters, this ML amoeba looking box sits on top of like regular infrastructure. So we're thinking about like, you know, it's like it's sitting in a container, which is in a pod, which is in a hypervisor, which is under GPUs. So now the real question of these standards, and they've really left it up for interpretation, is that which, what is in scope? You know, is it just the ML code? Does it include every other part of the AI system? Or does it also include this like finer components? And it's really not clear what we mean when we say AI system. So I wanted to take away that the technical reality of these standards when they face with the definition of an AI system, it's really going to be complex and it's really going to be left for interpretation. Now I'm going to come back to the bigger, uh, the, the big question that you know we looked at the AI system component of it. Uh, I now want to focus on the word calibrate. What does exactly calibrate mean in this context? And you know, let's just take a very 101 example of uh, an AI system. This is a out of the box image se uh, instance segmentation. Uh, from, uh, from a model called YOLO v5. Essentially what this model does is it takes an image and it identifies the different segments of that image. It's very straightforward. And really, it takes five lines of code. And best part, we didn't even have to write it, we just looked at the documentation. So you're loading the, you know, you're loading the model you're, uh, that's pre-trained and then you're pointing it to an image and then you're like essentially asking the model for the results and then you're printing out those results. It's as straightforward as that when you use a pre-trained model. So instance segmentation takes five lines of code and uh, we essentially asked uh, researchers like, hey, what can go wrong in this particular, like just with five lines of code, what can go wrong? And uh, there are two kind of like harms that I want to focus on because that's what even these acts tend to focus on. The first one is traditional security harms. So last December, and really kudos to the PyTorch team, they found that a malicious uh, dependency package called Tro uh, Torch Triton was uploaded to PyPy. And what happened was because the way PyPy uh, index works, uh, the malicious package kind of took precedence over the package in the official PyTorch repository. Now, this design really enables like uh, anybody to kind of like register a package with the same name, and using a third-party index, Pip will just install their version by default. So you can kind of imagine how just run-of-the-mill traditional security harms kind of affecting these sort of things. This, this, by the way, big kudos to the PyTorch team. They, um, I mean, I cannot even imagine a day before New Year having your SERP team trying to like look through this. But it, it's, a it's a good example of a traditional security harm to kind of keep in mind. But then with AI systems, we also have these like um, uh, AI-specific vulnerabilities. And the one that I want to point out uh, over here is um, what's called model inversion. So this is work done by ZCA and all. So essentially, uh, what happens is by, by just with API access to the model, with no access to the training data, with just API access, strategically you know, querying the model and observing the response has the ability to leak information about the private training data. So you can think in the context of like an instance segmentation, if you're gonna be leaking training data, that could lead to privacy violations. So, you know, traditional security harms and essentially these AI-specific vulnerabilities. Now, the EU AI Act really focuses on both of these types of harms. I know I put like a, a wall of text right here, but I really want you to focus on um, these two specific aspects. So, you know, they say, hey, you need to, if you are a provider of ML systems, you need to look at the cybersecurity aspect of it wherever you think it's appropriate. And at the same time, you need to look at the AI specific vulnerabilities where appropriate. And they give an example of an attack called adversarial examples, which we'll come to. So, the, when John and I were like looking at this text, you know, the, the first question we asked is who decides what's appropriate? Is that gonna be the ML engineer? Is that gonna be your program manager? Is that gonna be the lawyer in an organization? Is that gonna be the CISO? Or is it gonna be the CDAO? Or is it gonna be a regulator? This weasel world really gives power to organizations 
to define what is appropriate. And that is something that we need to keep in mind. And the second, uh, second thing we had was like, how often should these assessments be made? Unlike say, um, even compared to um, something as labile as cloud security, uh, cl uh, cloud services, AI systems change all the time. You know, you get new data, you get new features, you get new models. So how often are, you, uh, are, or are the service providers gonna be compelled to do these assessments? It's gonna be once a week, once a month, every time a feature ships, we do not know. And, at the, and as Azaria pointed out in her keynote today, the rate at which these systems move is at a breakneck speed, and these assessments can very quickly go stale if, it, if it's not correctly updated. Now, the question that it seems very obvious, what happens if these solutions just do not exist? And that is a big reality we need to contend with. And again, kudos to uh, the Google uh, research team who really acknowledge that hey, things like adversarial examples, this is not, these defenses are not yet ready for production. And really they come up with a growth mindset and they put this out. So what happens when these systems do not have uh, solutions? So that's kind of like, you know, the second lesson I want you to take away from this talk. You know, the language in these standards tend to be really vague and that makes calibrating trust very difficult. So I've been like dancing around the word trust for a little bit now. You know, we said we spoke about overtrust, we spoke about like um, why it's difficult, but I really want to double click on the word trust. It feels it's like good, you know, nice feeling. And for this, I'm going to use the definition from NIST AI risk management framework, which really is being touted as the solution uh, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. And again, I don't want to take away that people in NIST or EU AI Act do not know what they do. They're extremely brilliant people. These are just the externalities of analyzing it. And, you know, they really pack a lot of emotions into trust. You know, you want the system to be accurate, explainable, interpretable, robust, you know, bias, and it'd be no harmful use. So it becomes a suitcase where it's for a lot of these ideal properties that we want to kind of achieve. And I, I want to focus on two specific words here. I'm, I'm going to pull apart some of these words and look at the interactions. Um, and one of the factors I'm going to look at is robustness, which really is a fancy way of saying the property of conferring protection from adversarial manipulation. That's what robustness is. And you know, no talk on adversarial machine learning will be complete without paying homage to this classic picture from 2014. This is called adversarial examples. Essentially, the picture of a panda, you know, you add this like uh, imperceptible uh, noise to it and the resulting picture looks just as similar as the first one for humans, but unfortunately for machine learning systems, that one is very confidently classified as a gibbon. The running joke in the ML community is we don't even know what a gibbon looks like. We just assume it looks like a panda at this point. So it's a, you know, it's a classic, you know, people have a lot of fun with it. It's even mentioned in the EU AI Act. And I want to like bring your attention to how this can have real world implications. We've had a lot of talks about like, is this attack even relevant? And um, Vedant and uh, folks from University of Maryland kind of like had this very interesting study. And the, the takeaway from this picture is that attacks really do not affect all classes of data points equally. So what the researchers did was they built this very apocryphal example. You know, you're given a face and it predicts like the age of the person from the face. And what they did was they launched the very, uh, an adversarial example attack on these, like, on these systems, and that they found that for a black female face, the, the label changed, which means it's, uh, it's more fallible to the attack, but ironically, for a white male face, the label was very robust to this attack. So the takeaway here is that the same amount of perturbation flipped the label for, a, uh, for one class but for another class, it was very robust. So attacks really do not affect all data points equally. Interestingly enough, um, the defenses also do not protect all classes equally, and setting this, which means that setting the same standard for all of these data points may not really make sense. So this is work done from University of like, uh, Michigan State University, and they found that when you try to employ the same defense, they found 
one data set had like 67% uh, robustness accuracy, and the other half of the same data set only had 17% robustness accuracy. So that's gonna be this like problem where, okay, you can, you can choose to implement a defense, but you have to make a choice between what part of your data set you wanna protect more. And again, it goes back to this question of who is making those decisions, because it's definitely not the regulators, and this kind of opens up a lot of more questions. I also wanna draw your attention um, you know, to another, another thing, which also Aziria kind of mentioned, explainability in her keynote, and we already saw the robustness and bias, there's this tension. Explainability is a very desirable property. If I get my credit denied, I want to know like why it was denied. Uh, so now I wanna show you like how adding a third factor like explainability really also complicates the picture here. So this is my favorite um, experiment that Hima Lakaraju from Harvard did. So she recruits these like um, 40, experts from Harvard Law. So think of this as our future policy makers, um, you know, and she says, hey, I'm, I've built this classifier, and you know, the, the aim of the classifier is either, to say, is either to say, you know, this person gets bail, or this person does not get bail. So you give, them, you give this classifier all the details, and the, the ML model says bail, no bail. That's essentially the prediction task. And she asks these like law students, uh, hey, what are the features that the ML system should not focus on? And the top features came out like, okay, you know, the fact that somebody should get bail or not should not focus on uh, race, it should not focus on gender. What the ML system should really be looking at is, did they, you know, did they have prior convictions? You know, if they had a convictions and they failed to appear, you know, that's what the classifier should focus on. So no race, no gender. We want the classifier to be as objective as possible, and these are our desired features. So Hima and her students, this is a very clever experiment. They first construct a completely untrustworthy classifier. They build a classifier exactly on this uh, things that the, the, po the future policymakers are, these Harvard law experts say no. They build a classifier that takes race into account, and you can see like if race equals African American, you've already lost at that point. So they build this classifier behind the scenes. And what they do is they build uh, explanation systems for these classifiers, which I'll get into. And this is like the task that they give to the students. They don't, she doesn't show the classifier to them, she only shows the explanations. And she says, here are the explanations from three systems, and you need to tell me which explanation you trust. Now, remember, the, the classifier behind, completely untrustworthy, takes race into account. So she gives the students three explanations. One that comes straight out of a black box. One explanation, the second explanation kind of uses both you know, desired features and undesired features, so it mixes like race into the thing. So this is like you know, her kind of fessing up. And the third one, she gives an explanation that it only uses desired features. She completely hides from these future policy makers that you know, race was not even into the classifier. Again, cl the students do not know the classifier, they only see the explanations. So this is unfortunately your intuition because I put the devil emoji, kind of, you know, uh, she's trying to trick the students. A whopping 70% of these students pick the uh, manipulated misleading explanation. So this is kind of very interesting, right? These misleading, you know, explanations, they, they take prohibited features into account, they take race, they take gender, and they can be reconstructed using correlated features like zip code, and that's essentially what she's leveraging. So now I want you to reflect. You know, you are getting an explanation from an organization. You have no clue about their classifier. The only thing that you can judge is based on the explanations. And now we know that these explanations can be very easily gamed. And that has serious ramifications as well. Explanations is not really our goal. We need to have trustworthy explanations. And the bigger question that I have is that we saw this tension between 
oh, do I make it more robust? Do I make it more fair? Turns out that there's a lot of literature out that not only ask if I make it more robust, I make it less explainable. If I make it less explainable, I'm showing my hand to adversaries who may potentially want to game the system. So there's this like inherent tension and constructing this ideal AI system is no free lunch. And this brings us to like really important questions about trade-offs. And it goes back to this like original question around who is making these trade-offs. So keep in mind that there are this like broad swathes of tension between the security properties and the other desired properties. And I'm going to take us back to our final like you know like big question. We've been talking a lot. We, we spoke about how to calibrate. We spoke about like trust. We spoke about the kinks in AI systems. But I really want to double click on the word we. Who is the we over here? And for this, I'm going to take a look at uh, John and I looked at who really responded, you know, to the NIST AI risk management framework. So they have these like requests for information. Anybody in the public can virtually go submit you know, responses to that. And uh, they were, NIST was very transparent in publishing also who actually you know, responded to their RFI. Alas, you know, the, the, the disappointing thing for me is that um, the biggest voices in the room were the tech companies. And it always harkens back for me for uh, Julie Cohen's book, you know, Between Truth and Power. She talks about how the legal landscape and all these standards is really constantly stretched and pulled by informational capitalism. So it's not these standards are like divine laws that come from these standard organizations. There's an active set of folks who are building it to pull it to their interest. And the same kind of concept also applies over here. When we think of these AI risk management frameworks, when we think of the EU AI Act, we like to think of them as independent authority making decisions, but that's hardly ever the case. On the one hand, the tech companies, which we surveyed in 2020, they are completely unaware of the tools and processes to kind of secure AI systems. But they were essentially the loudest voices in the room. On the other hand, academia that's exploding with this sort of research, they publish two papers every day on this topic since 2016. Archive is bursting as it seems. They were essentially muted. And any time you think of like standards and certifications, the one to benefit the most are going to be, unfortunately, the consulting companies and the standard setting organizations themselves. And you know, let's just take, let's have an honest conversation about GDPR. You know, the US companies essentially spent $8 billion, most of, most of which was actually went to consulting firms and vendors. And sometimes it even takes money to go access the standard. So, you know, the, the, the burnt toast example that I had, it was actually not from the standard because I had to pony up like $500 to see it. So I just like took one from stock photo. That's my, that's my reveal over here. So even if you want to see a standard and if you want to see how it has been updated, you pay for every revision of that. So the same will also be applied for AI standards, especially by for-profit organizations. And I want to ask you the question, like, how are small businesses, which really form the backbone of the AI company, what are they going to do about it? And how are they going to bear these costs? How are independent researchers, are, how are they going to be looking at this? And what happens when you don't have money to pony up to consulting firms and lawyers to get certified? So, you know, the, the, I want you to kind of like take away that there's competing interest in, in making these AI systems achieve this normative good. And it's very difficult for us to actually completely agree in what is normative good in this particular space. So I want to bubble up. I want to, you know, just like zoom out. I know we've been in the weeds uh, for, you know, for, for a little while. We started off with kind of the seal analogy, like you know, the UL sticker that you may you will find in these electrical appliances. The question that um, that really struck for me and John is when was the last time to even check the seal of every electrical appliances that you bought? The stark reality is that for most people who interact with AI systems, they either won't know it's an AI system 
or they may not even have the means to discover that this, what standards the AI system is going to comply with. And just take a, just you know, take a take the example of the fire, right? If there was a fire and if there was a safety robot, are you going to stop and verify? that you know that emergency robot was NIST AI compliant or the EU AI compliant. That's gonna be afterwards. But at that moment, it really does not matter. The unfortunate reality for us as consumers is that you simply have to trust that the very people who are building these AI systems are adhering to the letter and spirit of these standards. And I wanna kind of like give you an example of how things can go wrong if we were to just place this blind trust. Um, this is like work done by the New York Times, and I want to kind of like first preface this by saying that there's already a standard for electronic vehicles in the EU. And reporting from the New York Times has shown that Tesla has repeatedly, in the reporting words, exaggerated the sophistication of the autopilot. And for me, that's the, the quote that really sticks in that reporting is from Jennifer Homnady, uh, the chairwoman of NTSB. And she says, like, where I get concerned is the language used to describe the capabilities of the vehicle. And now I want you to, like, really zoom back to the, the image of the trust resolution, right? When research goes dating back to the 1990s, that's repeatedly shown that there's a pattern of overtrust in AI systems and automation, organizations that are really building these standards um, and contributing to them really have not just a heightened moral and ethical, but they have a fiduciary obligation to society to communicate the capabilities of these systems. So what this really means is that if you are in an organization, you know, try to get past people who are the bluster and ensure that you're really empowering your customers with the right tools for trust resolution. And when, when we don't do that, even with a standard, you will see a rise in the amount of failures. This is, this is like reporting from Washington Post, kind of showing the increased risk. So I wanna really leave with you all, I know you're the brightest minds over here and you have agency within your organizations. If you, really, if you, re if you want real change, you know, it's not gonna happen until organizations really act with intention and there's a culture of empathy. And I feel that is going to be a big win for these um, regulatory levers. It may not be in the spirit of the law, but it's going to start fo forcing people to have these conversations. Um, you know, as before, uh, before I conclude, I, I really want to ta thank a whole bunch of people, Pirat, Mika over here, Hiram Anderson, for really helping me through this talk. And this, this would not be possible without my independent fellowship at UC Berkeley. So where we, you know, we encourage you to kind of ask these bold questions, which may otherwise not be possible. Really grateful for that as well. So uh, you know, these are the five lessons that I walked through. Uh, Hiram and I also wrote a full-fledged book, kind of like you know, looking at this from various different angles. Um, every cent that goes from this book, including our royalties in advance, goes to supporting two charities, Black and AI and Bountiful Children. So uh, we also always plug our charities towards the end. Um, that's my contact information. And I see that we're almost at time. So I'm going to like pause here. Maybe if you have questions, we, can, we have time for one or two questions over here, or else we can uh, hang out at the wrap room after this. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.